Hi, this is your host Sapin Bharatiya and today we have with us Liz Rice, Chief Open Source Officer at ISOLN. Liz, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's my honor to have you on the show. I've been, of course, tracking your career, you know, ever since I entered the, this whole cloud native space, open source space. Uh, but I would love to kind of take you on, you know, the kind of journey, uh, your own uh, tech journey, uh, not like not going too much back in the, but just talk about when you got, you know, <laughs> interested in open source and how you started this journey. I was always a software engineer, you know, sort of all my adult life and, and even as a child I was really into computing so um but a huge part of my early career was all around proprietary software it took me a long time to really get to grips with this whole idea of open source um and it wasn't really till I got involved in um well, the containers and, and the kind of cloud native community. Maybe I'd used a few open source libraries and I think I'd probably, you know, I, I remember one thing I, I submitted to a Python library once, you know, something that I needed and, and um, you know, submitted back upstream. And that was quite exciting, but I hadn't really been that involved in open source until I got involved in the kind of Docker community initially and, and that kind of whole world of containers that's now evolved into cloud native. Um, and all of that infrastructure software was being built open source. And I started to understand how this was, you know, um, the best way for people to collaborate and that people weren't wasting time kind of duplicating their effort and um i really fell in love with the model of um it, both the sort of efficiency of it the the innovation of it and the fact that you get to kind of work with people from around the world you don't just work with the people that you're you know in your own company but but all sorts of other people as well and i, and I love that i love going to events and meeting the folks that i know from from online and and that's that's always really fun uh thank you your passion but uh is there something you know specific about open source that you kind of fell in love with hey this is as you uh, mentioned that you submitted a patch and everything but uh, you, either you can talk about the community either you can talk about the, the contribution model that you don't have to prove yourself what what you know what is unique about open source i think it's the fact that people can um take a a thing you know something that's already out there and run with it and do something completely different with it or um you know tune it to their advantage, whether that's, you know, commercially or just because they're, they're fascinated. Um, I guess some examples that spring to mind are, are things like, um, you know, the Raspberry Pi community, how they seem to take everything, you know, that we do really for sort of data centers. And then they, they get it running on, on tiny little home labs running on Raspberry Pis. And, and obviously that's, that's kind of fun. Or um, another example um, that, that I did personally, and it was completely utterly pointless but um when uh virtual cubelet first came out and i had this crazy idea that i was going to use virtual cubelet to control a drone and i'm going to say i never completely got it to the point where i could get a the particular drone i had <laughs> to sort of fly for long enough before the battery ran out but uh you know just virtual cubelet was never at all intended to uh, to fly drones, but the, the, the idea that you can sort of mash up ideas and come up with all sorts of interesting inventions. And I think that's really, um, you know, a, a useless example of the kind of innovation that can happen when all sorts of people around the world can kind of build on each other's ideas. No, I mean, it's so true with the open source. I mean, if you look at the Linux kernel, you know, the way it's being used today, Linux never, you know, even imagined as, you know, you give example of Raspberry Pis. And so, yeah, it's it's incredible. Uh, now, if you can also talk about, if you remember, you did touch upon your first, you know, contribution, but what was the first open source project that you fully got involved with, which can be seen at the first, you know, kind of stepping stone into your open source journey, if you can remember? Oh, um... I mean, I suppose the, the slightly strange thing about the way that I came into open source was that a lot of the, what I think I'm now recognized as contributions were really around um, doing talks, you know. So I was doing things like explaining how containers worked. Um, I, I did a talk that you know, it's a few years ago now, but was pretty well received about writing uh, a, a container runtime essentially in about 80 lines of Go code. And 
that wasn't really a project, but it was really, I think, helping a lot of people to understand what a container is. I mean, putting that talk together helped me understand what a container is. And I built that talk based on a talk that I'd seen by Julian Friedman. So again, this whole idea of building on other people's um, work and, you know, we continually stand on the shoulders of the giants before us. Um, yeah, so I was, um, yeah, I, I suppose making talks and, you know, the, the codes out there, you know, the, the, the code that I used in that talk is, is available open source. Um, so I suppose that was probably the first thing that I did. It's certainly the first thing that really got any attention and that people were interested in, in, in what I'd done. And then you look at open source, uh, contributing code is not the only way people can contribute. Uh, writing documentation, as you said, you know, uh, spreading awareness, you know, that is also, you know, so, so I would also like, since you brought it up, that when we look at open source, talk a bit about uh, not only based on your own, you know, experience, but since you're also involved with a lot of projects and, you know, when we talk to projects, they're like, hey, yes, we have enough contributors, but these are the areas where we need help. Sometimes it's about advocacy. So talk a bit about how, what are the areas where folks can contribute to open source projects, which goes beyond just code contribution. Yeah. So today I'm really involved in the in the Cilium project, and we have this huge range of, um, I guess, expertise or skills that are needed across the project. You know, at one end we have kernel developers. I get to work with some incredible people who really know the ins and outs of the kernel and who built EVPF in the kernel. So that's an incredible skill set. But we also have, you know, people working on Go code, the interfaces with the, the EVPF. There are people working on um, the UI. There's people working on the documentation. There's people working on demos. There's so many different skills that we need across the project. And also, you know, th this um, idea of sharing knowledge, I think uh, increasingly we recognize in, in cloud native how important it is to acknowledge the, the folks who do go out and, and talk about technology and teach the technology and, and explain to other people why they find it compelling, why they think it's useful, why they think it's, you know, more efficient or, or whatever other benefits it, it has. Um, yeah, so there's loads of different skills that people can bring. I mean, art, <laughs> you know, you, you see things like um, the, the logos that people build. We just put together a thing called EBDEX, which is a collection of drawings of bees that essentially represent EBPF. And, um, you know, they're, they're really fun characters. And we know that people sort of engage with with that kind of emotional side. It's not all just about the bits and bytes and, and the lines of code. It's also about how do people sort of emotionally resonate with the project and the people in that project. And I think things like the EBDEX is, is you know, it, it's something that we've done to try and, um, you know, encourage people to feel involved with that kind of community. Now let's uh, talk a bit about, since we're talking about how uh, people can contribute, I also want to talk about uh, how you've seen the evolution of open source communities. First of all, there is no open source community. You know, there are communities depending on which project you look at. Because very early days where, where people were working in their free time at night, they'll just write a code. Now, most of the developers, they are on payroll to work on open source code base. So, which also means the, the whole community has also changed and evolved. How has it evolved? Yeah, I think it's very important that people are actually being paid, you know, proper salaries to work on this infrastructure code that companies rely on. And I think it's a very good thing that the majority of people working on at least the projects that I see across Cloud Native, most people are doing that with the backing of an employer who's who's making sure that they're financially secure. And, and that, I think puts everybody in a much more solid footing for contributing. I mean, there are still folks who are, you know, freelance or, um, you know, find, finding ways to, to keep themselves afloat. But I do think it's a good thing, really, that people don't think I'm just going to sit in my bedroom, write a thousand lines of code, and magically somebody will send me some money. You know, it, it just doesn't work like that. And I think a lot of the open source community has realize that the one of the main ways we can make this work is to have 
companies involved. You know, most most people on the planet work for a company, and uh, that there's no reason why open source shouldn't shouldn't be structured the same kind of way. And and it's all about aligning interests. The interesting thing about open source is we're not just aligning interests within one corporation. We're aligning interests across many organisations. You know, for um, for everybody involved in cloud native the rising tide floats all the boats. We have this incredible infrastructure software that we're building. That means that businesses can do whatever application specific things they want to do more effectively, more quickly. They can deploy things faster and get things out to their users more quickly. And it's in all their interests that we all collaborate effectively on this underlying infrastructure. And and I think that's great. Since we are talking about, uh, you know, uh, also one of the most important aspect of open source health is commercialization. So with these companies coming in, it also ensures that these projects are sustainable. It's not relying on one person's free time or one company's, you know, resources. It's not charity. It's like tied to your business interest. With this uh, commercialization, you know, and uh, as you said, a lot of folks who are on the payroll, how have you seen the culture within open source change? Because I do remember in early days, uh, even when I got involved with Linux, you know, sometimes they will send you, hey, go and read the manual, you know. Sometimes you will see uh, things were a bit rude. Hey, go and figure out yourself. Some communities were very friendly. Sometimes because everybody was working the free time and people were like, hey, you know, I'm just doing a charity and you are like, you cannot come and demand something from me. So can you talk about how you have seen the evolution of the culture of the community where do you see that it's becoming more welcoming, more friendly? Or do you think that it's still the community where people do feel apprehensive when they send a patch or code? I think a lot of the reason why Cloud Native, at least, has been really successful is because in the early days, people were very intentional. People who have much better understanding of how to build communities than I do really put in place some ground rules about things like code of conduct and, and you know, how governance works in the different projects. You know, thinking very carefully up front about, you know, well, what are we going to do if the maintainers disagree about something important? You know, how are we going to resolve those issues? And how are we going to make sure that people know you know, the boundaries of, you know, we expect people to behave respectfully to each other. You know, let's let's actually write that down. And I think that intentionality in the early days really laid a solid foundation for Cloud Native being a really welcoming place and, and you know, the project essentially being, um, it, it's expected that projects should welcome new contributors and help people through that kind of initial phase where people are figuring out, well, okay, how, how do I, you know, what are, the, what are the steps I need to go through in this project to make my contribution? I think projects these days do make efforts and, and they know they are expected to encourage people and give people that that sort of onboarding path. So that's that's a really good thing. And I think that has improved a lot. And we still have, you know, the tension between different organizations who maybe do have different, um, you know, interests. And, but I think it's really important that we, you know, balance and, and the organizations like the CNCF continue to provide this playing field where we can balance the interests of the big organizations, the smaller vendors, the up and coming startups, the individual developers, the projects as a whole, the end users, all these different, um, kind of cohorts of, of of people who are involved and we have to kind of balance everybody's interests across the foundation. And once again, you brought a very good point, which is, you know, uh, no, we don't live a perfect world. So there will always be uh, companies who are competing in the market, but their developers may be working together or they do see value. But traditionally, it's very hard for them to work together. But some of these neutral foundations like Linux Foundation, CNCF, which is, you know, part of Linux Foundation, what role do you think these foundations have played in creating an even playing field or also uh, build some confidence because, you know, we are also seeing companies, they just change license of their code base and they can lock a lot of, you know, potential contributors or existing contributors out. So do you see that these foundations have also played a very big role in popularizing the adoption of open source in the commercial space? Absolutely. And I think some of the um, ground rules that foundations can set can really give people confidence. So, for example, in the CNCF, 
Um, the default license that people contribute under is Apache 2, which is a you know permissive license. Um, there are some other licenses that are similar that are also accepted, but you know almost everything is is Apache 2, and the intellectual property is owned by the CNCF. So that provides a kind of guarantee to vendors, contributors, and end users alike that that's not going to change and those those licenses are not going to suddenly get converted into something different so uh, i think particularly for contributors it's important for people to know that the basis on which they made their initial contributions will continue into the future and and that nobody can come and take that work and you know they can build businesses that leverage that work for sure but they can't appropriate that intellectual property and and i think the foundations owning that neutral property in sort of on behalf of the community and providing that neutrality is really important to how it's foundational even <laughs> to how these um how we can have this collaboration across all these different organizations now i want to switch gear and quickly talk about security a bit uh, open source is often you know called you know it's more secure than closed uh, source first of all nothing is fully secure uh, <laughs> uh, if you're writing a code there will be bugs people will make mistakes with the configurations you know uh, and especially the cloud native work uh, where you know api will a lot of things are there so so talk a bit about what is your approach when we look at open source is more secure what makes it more secure and on top of that what kind of things folks should do when they look at or consume open source without blindly saying hey it's open source i can close my and use it blindly as the most secure code I've written <laughs> so uh, yeah nothing is ever secure so, <laughs> as you say <laughs> um and it's all a ca case of um you know trying to remove risk as much as we can and things like the fact that many pairs of eyes can look at the lines of code that are added is one way that we can try and avoid malicious code being added into the source code of open source projects. Um, it, things like um, supply, supply chain security, which has been a, a huge kind of buzzword for the last year or two, making sure that when users are deploying code it is actually built from the source code that they think it is because it's all, all well and good having this open source source code but you need to know that's what you're actually using in your deployment um, and i think a lot of work is really improving the security posture of these projects you know things like projects being encouraged to have s bombs so um bill of materials software bill of materials um having uh, the ability to scan projects you know foundations offer scanning for for free for or you know it, it, it's paid for on behalf of the projects so that uh, projects can um disclose the the vulnerabilities in their packages very but well, much more easily so that's all giving end users a lot more confidence i think there are some interesting kind of political angles to this so things like um different regulations that are being put in around the world requiring businesses to um you know take responsibility for the for the software supply chain that they're using and making sure that that doesn't create some um unnecessary uh, what you know we open source is open source and we can't impose commercial requirements on the open source code we can impose requirements on a commercial build of open source software but not on the source code itself and i know um particularly in the eu some of the regulations people have been a bit worried about um how some of that's been phrased so i think that's important that you know i i never imagined that my career would end up involving thinking about things like you know eu regulations but <laughs> you know, um th this stuff is really important i i actually um i do quite a lot of work with an organization called open uk and uh, a lot of that is involved with making sure that government in the uk and beyond understand the benefits of open source and how not to cripple it through terrible regulation you know? Liz, thank you so much for taking time out today and of course talk about uh, not only this topic share your journey and more importantly you know uh, the the how open source is evolving and also sharing how 
you know, individuals or organizations can, you know, get involved with open source. Thanks for all those insights. And as usual, I'd love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Absolutely. My pleasure. Hope to see you again soon.